We're really excited to be hosting Jeanette Munt as part of our programming at Hunter College MFA Studio Art Program. Um, and this is our now second online lecture ever. Um, we're, we're kind of excited to go forward with the online lecture, actually. So maybe we're going to do some things over the summer. Maybe the fall will be a hybrid thing. In any case, for those of you who aren't Hunter students under normal circumstances, we offer nine free public lectures per semester on campus, um, as well as twice yearly open studios, which has a really amazing affordable art auction. It's usually like 50 to 70 pieces of art to buy or uh, bid on. You can always see upcoming events on the department website, which I'm gonna post in the chat in a second. Um, or for those of you on YouTube, it's in the video description. Uh, also, it's going to be posted is a link to a GoFundMe independently organized by current MFA candidates to support the many working artists in the program who have lost all or most of their income due to COVID-19 and now being in lockdown for uh, almost 50, almost 60 days. Um, so we'd be deep, deeply grateful for donations of any size um, or if you could share the fundraiser to help us reach more people, which is honestly probably the most useful thing. Um, we will have a QA and a at the end, facilitated by my fellow MFA candidate, Christina Smith. So um, please write your questions in the chat during the lecture, but also um, you're welcome to put your name in as a stack um, and ask your question through voice chat, through video, however you want to. Um, lastly, a thank you to Hunter MFA alum Ricardo Contreras for setting up and hosting the YouTube stream so we can reach more people. And that is the end of my school announcements. So thank you all for being here. I'm happy to introduce Jeanette Munt. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I just want to quickly uh, give an intro to what I'm doing, what I'm going to be doing really fast. So I'm going to share a video that I made. And uh, the, the impetus for this is kind of the, the current situation that we're all in. So um, just to address it, we're, uh, my husband and I moved up to upstate to uh, our, we have a little barn here. It's like one room. It's literally just one room. And we came up here uh, mid-March, sort of completely, you know, into a rural experience out of, you know, it was the beginning of the pandemic, the beginning of the shutdown, everything was very confusing. Uh, and so our heads were really like completely in new zone, uh, unfocused, not determined, a little bit afraid. And so we spent uh, some time sort of not really thinking all that much, just kind of functioning. And then, um, and then we, uh, and then we slowly started thinking again. And part of what we, you know, sort when we came back to is kind of like why. Uh, like how do we how do we get back to making work, and uh, and more specifically as it, I kind of like moved through this, it was kind of like, you know, how would we, but also kind of why why would we why would I keep making work? Everything has changed so dramatically, and my head, you know, what I what I spent all of my time doing, you know, thinking about art, you know, and and I, you know. We spend a lot of time, I spent a lot of time thinking about work, thinking about art, thinking about thinking about painting, et cetera, et cetera. And then in this new world, it was uh, completely removed from this way of thinking that was familiar. And so I kind of really was like, why would we even, why would I even be making work? What, where does that come from? What pushes me forward? Why would I do this? You know, maybe I just don't for a while, but really quickly, you know, the drive came back and it was really clear that I wasn't going to stop actually. But the reason why I was doing it, you know, had, had sort of changed. It, experientially, it had changed drastically. So I no longer was kind of, you know, thinking critically or analytically or theoretically, historically, et cetera. I wasn't really thinking. And it sort of evolved, like as my husband and I started drawing and painting and working in this tiny space, you know, both of us together kind of on top of each other. What sort of became clear was that the, the art making had taken on a sort of a social dynamic, right? So my, my husband was drawing a lot during, you know, FaceTimes with family and friends. And I was, you know, painting while, um, you know, watching TV 
documentaries or you know Netflix or whatever and chatting and stuff so it was sort of it was the drive was there the work is being made I'm still going but really fundamentally the the reasons have shifted and they're gone and it's taken on this social aspect so what I wanted to do tonight was kind of share that because I don't think it's very unique I think we're probably I think a lot of people are experiencing this so what I wanted to do was sort of share that and talk uh, as I paint um, kind of go through the motions of this. So what I did, because I work in layers, is I recorded myself painting this. Uh, and so I'm gonna play that recording and then uh, continue painting this and talk. So hopefully, so you know, you'll get the, the full screen of me painting the recording. And then in the corner, hopefully you'll get the little screen of me continuing the same painting. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Let's see if I can do that. Share screen. Desktop one. Okay. So I think if I put this, uh, okay, so let's do this and I am going to expand it a little bit. Oh, of course it's moving. Okay, I'm just gonna play it and I'm gonna paint and I'm gonna talk. So, uh, if anything, you know, gets bumpy, uh, let me know if the audio or anything, somebody shout, stop me, because I could just get real into it and go. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do in lieu of this being sort of not the, the, the normal thought space for my work and maybe not, you know, art in general, whatever it is, is I wanted to get really personal. So I just kind of wanted to give my background and talk about like the what's at the core, what drives all of my movings in like art making, if that makes sense. So I'm just gonna do that uh, and then we'll go from there. Oh, I forgot to start my time, but that's fine. We'll just, somebody shout at me. Uh, okay, so we'll count down if I'm, okay, we'll just go. Okay, so. <laughs> I was born in New Jersey and I grew up in Switzerland. Uh, when I was 10, I moved to Switzerland uh, and, um, and uh, I had no real understanding of what it meant to be American at all. Uh, when I was 10, I just kind of moved to Switzerland and I went, ended up going to an international school. And an international school is one where um, it was very, very small and it's really catering to families whose parents, whose jobs, uh, you know, require that they move countries every two to four years. So it's a very small uh, community and it changes very often, very fast. So I, uh, my father did not have us. He was, we were in Switzerland for his job and he did not need us to move. So I was there for 10 years until I was uh, from 10 to no, eight, eight years from, until I was 18. And so this community that I lived in, you know, there was, you know, students, you know, every student uh, um, stood for the country that they came from. No matter how often they had moved, they stood for where they had just come from. And uh, this was really important in sort of forming who I was, because I was American. I was the American, you know, there was a handful of us, you know, but it was like, I was the American and uh, my brothers as well. And we understood ourselves to be American. And uh, this was kind of a really fundamental part of how I understood myself in the world. Uh, along with being female, because uh, being female is something that, um, you know, I have two brothers, so from a very early age, I understood that I lived in a very different world than my brothers, and I also understood that they didn't really understand that, that we saw the world very differently, uh, and that I was far more aware of this experience than them. Um, so I was very female, and then in Switzerland, I was very American. You know, and this is how we interacted as kids and it's how I understood myself. But also in Switzerland in the 90s, uh, you were really, um, you know, Americans were looked down on very, very much so. 
uh, and this was my experience. I know, I guess I'm, I'm gonna generalize a lot, but this was speaking from my experience. Uh, so the Swiss really did not, a lot of countries, but I'm just gonna speak about the Swiss because that was my immediate, immediate experience, but they didn't like us. And they didn't like, they, the stereotype was that we were fat and lazy and dumb. And so I lived in this kind of world where in my school, I operated as American and stood for American and wanted to be American. And then on the outside, I wanted to not give away that I wasn't Swiss. And obviously physically being white, I could pass as Swiss, but the second I opened my mouth, you know, it was, you know, really I got a lot of like, why are you here? Why don't you speak German? Why don't you assimilate properly? Why don't, why are you acting so American? Go home. Got this a lot. And this, this is language that's very familiar in our culture these days, unfortunately. But it's also just kind of like fear of the other racism or being afraid of the foreign, like 101, right? So I got this a lot. So I had this sort of outside experience where I wanted to be American in my school and stand for my country. And then I also wanted to not be American at all. And I ended up thinking a lot about what it meant to be American, what it meant to fill this role in this country and in one place be proud and in one place be afraid and nervous and try to keep it to myself, right? And so this, uh, this awareness really, you know, formulated a founded, con constructed who I was, you know, when I was young. So then I moved to America when I was 18 to go to Emerson uh, for writing. I really wanted the American college experience. This is what I wanted. I really thought I was American. I wanted the American college experience. So I went to Boston, to Emerson. And I really, 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 really quickly realized I was an American at all. In every way that I had believed myself to be American, I was, I was not. And Americans recognized me. Everybody uh, recognized me right away as not American. And so this was an absolutely uh, shattering experience where I lost all sense of who I was and how I fit in and what I expected of myself. I mean, down to like even the um, language. So I, I, you know, understood myself to be American. I had learned German. I had learned Swiss German. I had learned French, et cetera. And then I moved to my home country where I was going to speak my mother tongue. And then I didn't understand it. Like uh, I understand the words, but like I would go to, you know, parties and all of the, the you know, I'd be talking to a bunch of people and they would all be talking, 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 and then I would understand it and keep up. And then all of a sudden it would break and someone would say something and I could understand the words that were being communicated, but I didn't understand where they were coming from, where they were going. And so I couldn't keep up in the conversation and everybody else could. There would be this as a whole, everybody around would, would follow. They'd all speak in words that I understood, but I didn't, I couldn't follow it. So I would just drop out. And this happened over and over and over again. Finally, of course, I learned that they were things like, you know, Simpsons quotes or quotes from friends or, you know, lyrics from like Cherry Blossom Clinic or something from the 90s. I don't even know. But like, I, I knew the things. I had seen the Simpsons. I had seen the movies. You know, I knew, but I didn't know them inside and out. I didn't have a feel for the reference, have a feel for the rhythm. I couldn't keep up. So it was even to the point where like, I felt like I even no longer understood or spoke my mother tongue. So this, this put me on the outside, uh, really observing people, Americans, nationalities, you know, on, on top of already being concerned about like how you formulate yourself as a female and how you perform femininity and how you perform being female. You know? So I really ended up in this place where I was examining everything that constructs these significant parts of who we understand ourselves to be. So this is really at the core, at so much of the core of my thinking and my working in art. You know, so like it's really these, these constructs of, of people and personality. 
you know, so I am, um, I'm going to pay my tattoos now, so it's going to get intense. Um, I know them well, but I don't know them that well. Um, and that, that's weird, but, um, but so, you know, when I first started painting, I was painting a lot of like interiors from like 70s magazines, like how people experience themselves and put themselves forward in public according to their interior design and their taste. You know, this was really interesting. And then sort of I played with, you know, later I played with like having grown up in Switzerland. So I played with like um, mountains and, uh, and uh, you know, landscape and sort of played with the stereotypes of being Swiss because, you know, I really was thinking about how you, if you say like, oh, I grew up in Switzerland, like what do Americans think that means? That was part of me trying to figure out like how am I American? Like, what do Americans think I am and where I came from? And so part of it was this. And um, like all these weird details in the tattoos. So, um, So I, uh, you know, I really played with these, with these uh, mountains for a while, playing with the fact that I came from Switzerland and the fact that Americans understood Switzerland to be mountains. And there that gave me also this room to play with the language around that because I'm female, obviously, again, and I do a lot of thinking about that. A lot of language constructs like female and a lot of like mountains, like I specifically was painting this mountain called Jungfrau. The Jungfrau, you know, in German, young woman, virgin, Virgo, it has all of these like very female centric uh, ideas, uh, references rather. Uh, and so I was painting the Jungfrau for a while. And this, of course, allowed me to go into like the painting, you know, engaging with the history of painting, right? So landscapes and painting uh, uh, landscapes from images sort of gave it this kind of like from, from the internet, you know, I'd get the images from the internet. And this gave it kind of a much more sort of contemporary uh, conceptual construction because it's like, you know, I was going, just painting from the internet. So this was sort of early on. But then also I painted, you know, I went on to paint, or I continue to paint a lot of females, right? I'm really interested in these archetypes. It's how we understand through these archetypes, how you construct yourself as a person, right? This is all like, none of this is, is particularly new, but it's like very exciting to me. So I did a lot of painting of like femme fatales, like um, Patricia Arquette in Lost Highway and Eve and um, who else? Lots of, uh, you know, even the like, uh, like Elizabeth Taylor in Suddenly Last Summer, you know, pulling these women who we know so well to stand for women, you know, and then even, you know, obviously myself, I began playing with this idea that I, I am the archetypal woman, that I can play this role, that I can take 